Morning, Emmanuel. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter 13, and we'll uh, close this season that's been uh, uh, profitable for many of us of going through Romans 13 and thinking about how to uh, fight our uh, sin. Uh, I do want to encourage the college students who are going to come out this Thursday night uh, to abide by uh, whatever uh, social distancing guidelines Pastor Evan lays out on Thursday night. We do not want to be the epicenter of another college out- outbreak uh, in the United States. So uh, help us avoid that uh, by playing your part. And uh, that's all I got to say about that. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. Romans 13, verse 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies, in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Lord, we come before you. And we know, we confess, we believe that your word of God, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, that, that I am called right now to wield the sword of the Spirit, and together with me, the saints, as they hear the word, as even the devil tries to chip away at the word, are called to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And Lord God, we pray that we would be built up in our holy faith, and not in some abstract way, but actually to be more like Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you would target every place of unbelief in this room and that you would assault it with your faith-giving word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'm hoping to do this morning is to help Christians grow in their Christian lives. Now, I know in one sense that's what we're doing every week. All of our preaching at Emmanuel is aimed to help unbelievers become believers and then to help believers grow into greater and greater Christ-likeness. But when I say I want to help Christians grow this week, I mean something uh, slightly different. I mean that I want to give you the basic building blocks of growth. I want to give you the raw materials that can be used to build a strong Christian life. I want to give you the ingredients that can sustain a Christian life that's maybe been going on for a number of years already. A lot of students here are heading back to school, a lot of teachers heading back to school this week, and you're setting up study spaces or teaching spaces to prepare to teach or to prepare to learn. And in the same way, I want to give you what you need to learn and grow as a follower of Jesus. I want to give you three things you need to get if you're going to grow. And here's why I want to do this. This morning, this evening, we're going to baptize a new convert. And I want her to know the basic building blocks of growth. Over the course of this sermon series, it's been neat how much feedback there's been from children speaking about the call to be spiritually awake. And I want each child to know the basics of how to grow as a Christian. Uh, this Sunday, we have many students visiting us with us from uh, U of L, Spalding, Boyce, Southern. And I want those who are stepping into adult life to know how to build the basic building blocks of growth. 
In this season, many adults have been thrown into confusion. They're not sure what to believe, what's right. They feel confused about what to do when, what to wear when, when to mask up, when to not mask up. Is it all super serious or is it not serious at all? I want us to be reminded of those things that are sure. The basic building blocks of a Christian life, a life that will last forever. And of course, here this morning, there are those exploring Christianity. I want you to know what you're getting into. The Christian faith teaches that Jesus was God who came as a man to die on the cross to take the death penalty for sinners. For all, he takes the death penalty for all who repent and believe in Him. And once He saves someone, they are His until they die and for eternity after they die. But between now and when we die, there's a life to live. And that life is a life of growing to be more and more like Jesus. I want you to know what you're getting into should you decide to become a Christian. Let me give you three simple building blocks for growth. Here they are. You need to get these things to grow. Get community, get vision, and get specific. Let me start with get community. We're looking at a passage that calls Christians to live out their faith wide awake, to put their faith into practice in light of the second coming of Jesus. He's coming back. And I want you to notice something so small and insignificant that even though we've read this little passage in Romans 13 uh, multiple times, you probably haven't noticed it. It's that little word, and the verses we're focusing on this morning are verses 13 and 14, and this little word appears in verse 13 and it's the little word, us. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Romans was not written the way you and I normally read it. We normally read it alone in a chair or in a closet or in some private space as if it was God's letter to you personally. And of course, in one sense, it very much is. But we need to remember that when Romans was written, it was written by an apostle to a church, to an entire congregation. That is the way it would have been read originally, was not to a person, but to a people. And Paul says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. And we're, we're likely, especially in our generation, to mention just how plural, just how corporate the commands of the New Testament are. One of the great weaknesses of the English language is that it doesn't have a second person plural, which is why all, everywhere you go, uh, every different region you go to, there's some way to fill in that lack of a second person plural. So if you're up north, you're going to get you guys, or if you're in Pittsburgh, you're going to get yints, or if you're in um, Louisville, you're going to get you all. If you go further south, you're going to get y'all. And all of that is compensating for the fact that there isn't a second person plural in the English language. And that actually greatly uh, emaciates and diminishes our ability to understand what the New Testament is saying. Let me read uh, this passage to you one more time, just sensitizing you to the fact that all the yous in this passage are y'alls. They're you guys. They're, they're plurals. They're speaking to us, not to you and me singular, but to us and we. It says there, besides this, y'all know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and in jealousy. The whole passage and really most of the commands of the New Testament are written to be obeyed by Christians together. Christians in community, Christians gathered in local churches. Notice the image we're given for the Christian life and Christian obedience in this verse. It's, it's the image of a walk. Notice this, let us walk properly in the daytime. If you've ever felt like, oh man, my Christian life is kind of dull, I'm just putting one foot in front of the other, you're doing something right, not something wrong. The Christian life is meant to be a walk a lifestyle, a one foot in front of the other pursuit of what Eugene Peterson called a long obedience in the same direction. 
And so we're told that that walk is not to be a lone ranger walk, though. It's much more like the fellowship of the rings than the lone ranger. It's let us walk together. It's a, it's a group project, not a solo project. Let us walk together. Let us learn to walk properly together. And so one of the most important things that you can ever get into your Christian life is a community, a local church, where you are learning to walk together. Let me give you a few reasons to get community. First, get community so you can obey Jesus. You need to get community so you can obey Jesus because you literally can't obey Jesus without the community of the local church. He taught us to teach others to obey everything he commanded, and many, if not most, of the things he commanded can't be done unless you are in the community of a local church. Just take, for example, the one another commandments. If you look online and just Google the one another commandments, you'll come up with lists that vary from 60 to 100 verses long of how many one another commandments are in the New Testament. I'll, I'll read a few of them to you. Uh, Romans 12, 1, lo- 10, love one another. Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Romans 12, 15, 7, welcome one another. Romans 16, 6, greet one another. Rome, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, comfort one another. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, forgiving one another. You, you, I could go on, but you get the point. Christianity is a religion that saves individuals so they can walk together in the love of a community. Let us walk properly, the Bible says, and apparently part of walking properly is walking together. Get community to obey Jesus. Second reason I'll give you to get community is get community so you can see Jesus. It's amazing to me that when Paul starts unpacking the Christian life, and that's what we've been in the midst of in Romans chapter 12, when Paul just starts unpacking the Christian life in the book of Romans, the first place he goes is to using our spiritual gifts together. He says in Romans chapter 12, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Or in 1 Corinthians 12, when he talks about spiritual gifts, he says, and don't brush over this, he says the spiritual gifts are a manifestation of the Spirit. You want to see more of God working in the world? We actually see God working as He's manifest through the Spirit of God. In others, there's a reason why D.A. Carson's book on the spirit, spiritual gifts is called Showing the Spirit, because that's what we're doing. Uh, this week I was in a book study, and uh, one of the folks who was in the book study was Pastor Matthew Husted. And after the book study, I turned to him and asked him some advice on how I could love a person in my life a little bit better. And uh, Matthew began to answer, and I'm sure he wasn't thinking in these categories, but he really began to use his gifts of teaching and wisdom. And he began to explain some things from things he'd been reading. And before I knew it, I was asking advice from someone else. But as Matthew began to explain what he'd been reading about God, I just found myself worshiping because there were some issues of the character of God that I hadn't been able to bring together. And as Matthew explained a few things, I was just in awe of how what he said made it all made sense to me. And what was I seeing? I was seeing the very Spirit of Christ. I was seeing the teacher himself teach me what God is like. That's what's happening when we're using spiritual gifts or when others are simply speaking and caring for us in the strength which God supplied. Those are holy moments where we are encountering God himself ministering to us. Get community so you can see Jesus regularly. Third, get community so you can suffer with Jesus. In our consumeristic age, where we're always asking, is that a good deal for me? We forget this one. We should get community so we can suffer with Jesus. If you join a local church, you will suffer. Friends will let you down. Believers will sin around you and against you. Leaders will let you down. The saved sinners of the church will hurt you with their failures. They'll hurt you with their zeal. They'll hurt you with their lack of wisdom. And if you're thinking, well, I need to find a church where that's going to happen less, it won't work. 
Eugene Peterson, I'm quoting again, uh, tells a story of he's pastored, he pastored three churches in the course of his lifetime, and he said, each time I showed up at that new congregation hoping to create the new Jerusalem, but sinners kept showing up and demanding baptism. That's how they all work. You try to make things perfect, and sinners keep showing up and demanding baptism, and you're one of them. And so far from something going wrong when we're called to suffer in the context of the local church, that's actually something going right. We're being called to suffer with Him. Ephesians 4.2 calls us to bear with one another, and we are all a lot to bear. Romans 15 tells us that we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. When was the last time someone said, I need more of not pleasing myself in church life? Give me something miserable to bear with. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up, for Christ did not please himself. But as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus took a lot of garbage to love us, and we are to take a lot of garbage from each other. We too often forget that we're called to get community so we can suffer with Jesus. Fourth, get community so you can stay with Jesus. Get community in the local church so you can stay with Jesus. This is a major theme in the book of Hebrews, that we need each other to stay on the straight and narrow of walking with Jesus. John Piper, in summarizing this theme in the book of Hebrews, talks about salvation being a community project. Not that we as a community save ourselves, but that once saved by the shed blood of Christ, we as a community are instrumental in keeping one another in the faith. Let me give you an example of this from Hebrews. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm until the end. You need a company of encouragers and exhorters who will speak to you when you are tempted to waver. We should get community so we can stay with Jesus. If you're going to grow as a Christian, you need a team to be on. You need an army to join, a community to be a part of, a family to love, a fellowship to walk properly with. If you're a new convert, a new student, let me encourage you to join a Bible-preaching, gospel-loving church that is shaped according to the Scriptures. If you're a child of Christian parents, recognize this, that one of the greatest graces in your life is that your parents take you to a church where the Bible is preached. That is more important than everything else that will help you grow. Don't let your passions for music or sports or anything else be greater than the love of God, than the love you have for the Word of God coming to your soul in the church. That is more important than your physical fitness. That is more important even than your intellectual development. Though if you love the Bible, you'll find yourself intellectually developed and loving physical fitness as well. If you're new to Louisville, don't just visit biblical churches or sample them. Join one. Commit yourself to a group of imperfect leaders and followers and learn to obey, to see, and to suffer with Jesus, with, with them. Trust God that He can use the church to help you stay with Jesus. Alone, you are vulnerable to all kinds of self-deception, even though alone often feels holier. It's amazing how holy we feel when we are alone. We think some, we should do something, we do it, we approve of what we did. Marvelous. <laughs> but Proverbs 18.1 says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. And if you've been a member of this church for a long time, and the honeymoon is over, and the shininess is gone, remember that churches can be good like old marriages. You may not still be Twitter-pated or on cloud nine, but there's a sweetness to long-term commitment. Join a church, get a community, 
and you will have found one of the great building blocks to build a faithful Christian life. Second, get vision. I want to actually bring together a number of things I've said over the last few weeks from Romans 13, 11 through 14. I want to kind of bring them together, and I want to show you how Paul is giving us vision for the Christian life and how key that is. Let me just remind you of the structure of the passage we're in. First, the Apostle Paul has unpacked the gospel in Romans 1 through 11. Then he said our whole life is to be offering ourselves up in response to the mercy of God in Jesus offering himself up. And now, here in uh, Romans chapter 13, he says, wake up. You can't take these commands lying down. You can't take these commands sleeping. You can't sort of yawn your way through the Christian life. You need to be alert. And so he gives us the central command to wake up. And then he gives us two reasons to obey that command. One, your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. And two, the night is gone and the day is at hand. And then he tells us not once, not twice, but three times, quit sinning and obey Jesus. Quit sinning and obey Jesus. Quit sinning and obey Jesus. But what I want to notice again is how each time he comes at us calling us to obey Jesus, he's giving us a little bit of vision in how to live the Christian life, in what it is to live the Christian life. Notice four things. It is end time significant. It is a significant battle. That's the second thing. It is um, something we can do with a clean conscience, and it is deeply relational. First, he says, the night is gone, the day is come. He wants you to know that you're not living in some lull in human history. You're living in the last days. You are living when the last event of human history is getting closer and closer and closer. That's where the Christian is. They're not in some per forgotten period of church history. They are in the last days. And so that brings a certain vision to our Christian life, a certain importance to it. Then he gives us a, a, a vision for significance. He says, put on the armor of light. And we remember last week we saw that that imagery of obedience as armor, how just simple obedience is looked at as putting on the armor of light. That comes from Isaiah where Jesus, when he moved to save us, he girded himself with armor so that he could come down and win the battle for our salvation. And now our Christian lives are not just going through the motions. They are actually a participation in Jesus' own battle. Our loving, our being kindness, our being kind, our believing is actually fighting the good fight of faith. It's actually putting on the armor of light. I'll tell you what, for a preacher, that's not bad motivation. What are you doing this morning? Reading and proclaiming the Word of God, wielding the sword of the Spirit, coming to take my friends captive to every, every thought of theirs captive to Christ. That's a glorious reason to live. And every part of the Christian life is like that. It's a putting on of the armor of light. Now, the third one I'll get to in a minute is obviously significant. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to back up to this middle command to obey, which is that we are to walk properly. And I, I want to just confess to you that I guess I've uh, had it in my mind that this was kind of the boring command of the three. This was sort of the, the boring one. Put on the armor of light. That sounds good. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who doesn't want that kind of communion? And walk properly. KJV, walk decently. Who gets encouraged by decency and doing what's proper? Well, the problem was really with me. I was thinking about it all wrong. There is a deep human, there is a deep hunger, even in the non-Christian heart, for a proper and a decent kind of morality. There's a strong desire for that. There's a reason. Yes, 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 we constantly feel our culture pushing towards lawlessness, but there's a reason why Mormonism and Islam and various shapes of morality that keep you on a straight and narrow path, there's a reason why they have an appeal. There's a reason why in 1980, 40% of converts to Mormonism were Southern Baptists. 
Because when you're not a born-again person living in some nominal hypocritical church, it's very attractive to see people actually living out a proper and decent life. There's a reason why people escape the degradation of hip-hop culture for Nation of Islam. There's a reason why that sort of clean-cut discipline has a deep attraction to men and women. But of course, for the Christian, we learn to, learn, we learn to walk properly, not as some exercise in self-righteousness, not as some sort of works righteousness project, but we learn to walk properly, conducting our marriages and our finances and our training of our children, and even our singleness. We learn to walk that in decency, not so we can feel proud, but humbled by the fact that we've been washed by the blood of Christ. And we've been given the Spirit that helps us to walk decently, not with a chip on our shoulder or patting ourselves on the back, but with a humble heart that says, I can't believe I've been called into the right way to live that God has ordained, even though I did everything by myself to walk away from the right way to live and the way to live that God had ordained. Paul gives us a vision for living in the end times. He gives us a vision for living a life that's significant, putting on the armor of God. He gives us a vision for walking with a clean conscience, to walk decently. And then he also gives us a vision for a relational walk with God. We are called to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. His character is to cover our entire lives, like our clothes cover our entire lives bodies. We are to put Him on. Obeying Jesus is not just following the instructions of the Bible. It's a following Him, a believing Him, being made like Him. It's a participation in Him. His life flows in us like a vine's life flows into the branches. We do not only fellowship with Jesus when we read our Bibles, but really through our whole life of obedience. I don't know a better way to sum this up than an old hymn, which I found out in the first service, no one knows. But everyone was able to sing by the second stanza. This is a marvelous unpacking of what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me sing it to you. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. By His love and power controlling all I do and say. We sing it with me? May the Word of Christ well richly in my heart from hour to hour so that all may see I triumph only through His power. May the peace of Christ my Savior rule my life in everything that I may be calm to comfort sick and sorrowing. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea. Him exalting, self-abasing, this is victory. May I run the race before me, strong and brave to face the foe, looking only unto Jesus as I onward go. May His beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win. And may they forget the channel seeing only Him. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the whole prayer of that song. We need vision to live the Christian life, don't we? We need to know that we're in an age passing from darkness to light, that we're soldiers of the light, we're walking in the right and proper way that can make our consciences smile, knowing God is smiling. 
We need to think relationally about our Christian lives so that we do not descend into the dreariness of mere rule following. We need vision. John Piper said years ago, for many, Christianity has become the grinding out of general doctrinal laws from collections of biblical facts. But childlike wonder and awe have died. The scenery and poetry and music of the majesty of God have dried up like a forgotten peach at the back of the refrigerator. We need vision. Where does that vision come from? First and foremost, it comes from sitting under the preaching of God's Word week after week after week when our souls get tired and shriveled. God's Word keeps expanding our view of God and our view of the Christian life and keeps us motivated to keep following hard after Jesus. It's normal if you're happier about going to church after you were there than before you came. That's normal. More than anything else, we need to sit under God's Word as is preached to keep catching a motivating vision for the Christian life. And if you're not getting a motivating vision for the Christian life, maybe there's a wisdom in Saturday night or Sunday morning getting a little more time to pray that God would come and meet with us as we sit under His Word. There's that great Dutch proverb for the preacher, you pray me full and I'll preach you full. Also, your times in the Word alone will give you greater vision for God and the Christian life if you've been sitting under the Word of God in the church. You will find yourself over the years understanding your Bible more, seeing more there, and able to feed yourself more and more as time goes by. If you're a young believer, you need vision to get you going in the right direction. And if you're an old battle-weary believer, you need vision to keep yourself from becoming a battle-hardened believer in the Christian life. We need vision. We need community. We need vision. And we need to get specific. This is underestimated, but it is so important. If you are going to walk a faithful Christian life, you will not just need community. You will not just need vision. You will need to get specific. I want you to notice something. When Paul helps us fight sin, he names names. He gets specific. He does not say vaguely, fight sin. He says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. This is the way he often helps us fight sins. He names names. He names specific sins and says, stop that. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. That's sort of the rainbow of anger, isn't it? He doesn't miss any kind of anger or frustration. Or in Colossians 3.5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. When preachers start talking like this from the pulpit, they often get accused of meddling. But really, all they are doing is being biblical and they are helping people grow. Have you ever thought about why it is so important to name names when we talk about sin? Here's the first reason. It's comforting. It's comforting to get really specific when you deal with sin. That's right, it's comforting. One of the devil's greatest tricks, I don't know if I could come and sit beside each of you and say this to you in your ear, I would. One of the devil's greatest tricks is to make us feel alone in our sin, unique. No one else sins like me. No one else struggles like me. Real believers don't struggle like I struggle. 
One of the reasons it's good to name names when it comes to sin is that it helps those who feel like they're the only ones struggling with something to know that they are not the only ones struggling with something. Did you know real Christians have fallen into orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, jealous, jealousy, quarreling. The young college student who does not know how to handle their freedom and winds up passed out after a night of sexually debauched partying needs to know Christians have failed in this way before. The Christian who is drinking way too much alone every night needs to know that these are the kinds of sins Christians can struggle with. We do not need to hide. We can talk to each other. We can get victory together. Have you ever fallen into quarreling in your marriage and thought that when you show up at church, you need to hide that from all the other couples who never quarrel? It's amazing to me as a pastor, one of the common things that happens in the church is that people sit together, hundreds in a room, and all feel like they have troubles that no one else in the room could relate to. That is the devil's lie, not God's truth. We, the reason the Bible talks about these sins to the church is because these are the sins that struggle, the people in the church struggle with. I love the way Matt Chandler puts that. You can be a mess. You just can't stay there. Isn't it comforting to know that others have fallen where you've fallen and that God spoke to them words to guide them out of their sin? Not just to condemn them in it, but to get specific, to name names, to comfort them, and to bring them out into the light. You should have hope this morning, no matter where you've been. God is after people like you and me. Second, it's humbling to name names. It's humbling to get specific. We all tend to view some sins as more serious than others. And in one sense, that's true. It is worse to actually commit a murder than to just conspire to commit one. Some sins are worse than others. But naming sins that displease God can help us remember how sinful our sins really are. You might be reading through this passage going, orgies, I'm good. Drunkenness, I'm sober. Sexual morality, I'm faithful. Sensuality, I look away when temptation strikes. Jealousy, Hmm. Quarreling? Just listen to the soundtrack in some of our cars this morning. These are in the same list as the big ones. Yes, they are. And that's humbling. Though we've grown so much, we still have so far to go. And it's good to have a reminder that we still need the grace of God even for our quote-unquote more respectable sins. It's humbling to get specific. It's also life-changing. When we name our sins, we can actually get victory over them. Countless Christians pray every day, Lord, forgive me of my sins. But if you ask them what their sins are, they actually have very little to say. They confess pride. I've confessed pride. And then you ask for an example, and they're not sure. Many live in a vague sense of guilt, but they do not live under a keen sense of their real, actual sins. The results are devastating. It was pointed out to me in a Ray Ortland sermon that Paul Tournier, a Swiss psychiatrist, observed, a diffuse and vague guilt feeling kills personality whereas the conviction of sin gives life to it. When we just feel sinful in general, it often does us very little good. Yes, we are generally sinful, but sin must be dealt with in the particulars. It must be named and confessed. That's, just, that's where God's promise to meet us is. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Beloved, in private prayer, in gospel community groups, in a men's or women's discipleship group, to a faithful parent or an old friend, confess your sins. And God will not only forgive you, but lead you into real 
actual practical righteousness. Name names. Get specific. This leads to real life change. The last thing I want to point out to you about getting specific is it will make you wise. It will make you wise to get specific with your sins. Getting specific about your sins will help you deal with it wisely. Let me explain. Many of us keep falling into sin not because we want to be rebellious in our best moments. Most, most of the Christians here are not sitting here, can't wait till the sermon's over. I'd like to rebel a little bit more. This is actually the time of the week where we're like, Lord, make it a better week. There's these good desires that the Holy Spirit is producing in our hearts under the Word. We don't want to be rebellious in our best moments, but because we are fools, we fall in our weakest moments. Dealing with sin takes wisdom. The idea is literally here in Romans 13, well, let me just read you the verse. Romans 13, 14 says, make no provision for the flesh. The flesh, of course, all those sinful desires that even the Christian still feels so strongly. Make no provision for the flesh. Uh, literally, this word provision can mean make no plans for the flesh. Don't, don't make plans to go out and gratify your flesh. If you're trying to lose weight, but you stop at Kroger on the way home and fill your freezer with your favorite ice cream, you are going to fail. The scale is going to tell you that it did not work again this week because you essentially ask to fail. You set yourself up to fail by walking into and actually making a provision for that which would lead you to fail. I heard a great illustration of this years ago from a couple who talked about their desire to go on walks together. Nothing wrong there. And uh, when they went on walks together, they liked to go through uh, show homes. Nothing wrong there. But they found after a while of walking through show homes that they were less and less content with their home. And they were actually filled with jealousy and envy towards those who got to live in show homes. Now, someone will undoubtedly take this part of the sermon and say, you know, Ryan doesn't even think Christians should go through show homes. That would be a lack of wisdom on your part in listening to the sermon. <laughs> this is not about laying down new laws. This is about gaining wisdom in dealing with your specific sins. There are things you shouldn't do because of who you are and because of where you fail. Some of us think it's a good idea to take our, our, our phone with us into our devotional closet even though we have no self-control. Guess who always wins that battle? It's not Isaiah. We need to understand that there's wisdom not just in fleeing sin, but fleeing those places where we might leave a place for it. If you know you're depressed, it's not the time to put alcohol in the cupboard. We want to make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And that takes some advanced planning. And that planning is only able to be made wisely if you get specific and you understand where you struggle with sin. When you get specific about sins, it is surprisingly comforting. You find the sins the Bible names are actually the ones you deal with. The Bible is dealing with and helping, and helping us love real sinners, sinners like you and me. When you get specific with your sins, it's humbling, but it's enlivening too because that's actually the pathway to life change. When you really address real sins, you can find mercy and grace and help in pursuing righteousness. You can find wisdom. And when you name sins, you can start to get wise about how to avoid them. Emmanuel. One of the mottos that I've just always loved for ministry, I've heard it many different places, but I, I heard it originally from the lips of James Montgomery Boy, so that's who I heard said it. And it's this, that evangelicals have overestimated what they can get done in five years, and underestimated what can be done in 20. It's amazing what happens if you devote yourself to something for a long time. And I want to say to you, 
don't judge how well you're growing by what you think God can do in three months or six months or five years. Although He can do marvelous things, He's in the business of growing fruit, and fruit has a habit of growing slowly. And yet, give almost any Christian a pattern of being in community, getting vision into the Word of God, and dealing specifically with their sins, oh, their holiness is but a matter of time. Their maturity, their becoming oaks of righteousness is but a matter of time. Devote yourself to the right things. Put yourself in the place where God has says His grace will flow, and you will find it flows to you. Not always perceptibly. Trees don't always grow that way. But really and truly, you will find change in yourself and others as you get community, get more of a vision for Him, and get specific in your dealing with sins. I've had the privilege of watching some of you grow for 5, 10, and 20 years. It's beautiful. Some of you may be making fresh resolves for the first time in your Christian life. I hope I'm here in 20 years to see what God has done. It will be beautiful. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We praise you. We thank you for your marvelous way of building your saints week by week, month by month, year by year, as the last day approaches. Lord God, we pray that you would give us community that loves us and that we love. We pray that you give us a greater vision every Sunday that keeps us going. And we pray that you'd help us to be the kind of skilled surgeons who can get specific with our own sins and the sins of others to help and encourage and strengthen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.